The proton pack is not a toy. I guess it's right. Hey, ghost heads. It's Heidi from Channeling Spirits. The proton pack. It's one of the most iconic pieces of fictional equipment. But is there any science behind how it works? Sort of. Follow along as we uncover the evolution of how it came to be, and more importantly, how it works. You know, it's just occurred to me we really haven't had a completely successful test of this equipment. The birth of the Proton Pack dates back to Dan Aykroyd's first inspiration for Ghostbusters. I vividly remember when I first had the idea. It was around the autumn of 81, and I was in my old ancestral farmhouse. One afternoon, I was alone, and I picked up a copy of the American Society for Psychical Research. Anyway, there was this article on parapsychology and quantum physics, and I read a theory in there that if you build the right hardware, it might be possible to freeze, at least momentarily, the image of an aberration. I thought, wow, that's neat. It just started me wondering. Dan's original idea and script were pretty outlandish, and we'll detail them in another video. One of the core concepts through every draft was that Ghostbusters were mundane exterminators. What are you supposed to be, some kind of a cosmonaut? <laughs> no, we're exterminators. Who explored the supernatural. They would need a set of tools to capture and trap the poltergeist pests. Dan's first treatment, then titled Ghost Smashers, did have proton packs, but not the ones we are familiar with. Where did Dan come up with an odd name like Proton Pack? Maybe it was the Star Wars Holiday Special. Hi, Iggy. I brought you that Proton Pack. Mm -hmm. But probably not. Attached to the pack are Neutrona wands, and in Aykroyd's original concept, they were more wand-like than the end design. Attached via thick black flex cords to a back-mounted proton power source, the wands were strapped in place at the wrist, one on each arm, and extended out along the palms to a point six inches beyond the fingertips. When fired, by means of an elbow toggle switch on the backpack, phosphorescent beams of red and green light issued forth. With a potential budget in the hundreds of millions and an otherworldly concept, Ivan Reitman originally passed on the treatment. Undaunted, Dan finished the first draft and hired John DeVicus to draw conceptual illustrations. He submitted those along with a videotape of him in a jumpsuit and a homemade proton pack made from styrofoam and old radio parts to Ivan. Ivan took a second look and suggested bringing on Harold Ramis to create a more grounded script. They created several drafts and by August 5th, 1983, there was a deleted scene involving the introduction of their quintessential tool. Despite never being named in the final film, Egon does name it the Proton Pack and Neutrona Wand. The wand is 10 inches long and connects to the pack with a cable. Peter still remarks, each of us is wearing an unlicensed nuclear accelerator on his back. But Egon corrects him, saying that there is no fissionable material involved. To test it, they need to plug it in into a wall, which causes a massive power outage. There is a storyboard by Tom Enriquez detailing the captured sequence of Slimer, which shows the dual wrist-mounted wands. The blackout scene would remain in the September 30th copy, but ultimately be cut as Ivan Reitman felt it was better to have their equipment first demonstrated in action. What the hell are you doing? That September, Reitman also hired Stephen Dane, an incredibly accomplished designer and illustrator. Stephen was fresh off of the success of Blade Runner and asked to create some concept art for the Proton Pack. Dane's idea was to have the wands fold down over the shoulders with two handles and triggers. But by the September 30th draft, the script would only have one Neutrona thrower, which is frequently called a particle thrower. With a single emitter connected by hose to a backpack, one piece of real-world equipment came to Steven's mind. I then drew up some rough sketches based off of flamethrowers I had seen in a few military magazines. Once I had a basic idea and shape, I went out and got a pack frame from California Surplus on Santa Monica and Vine in Hollywood. 
I ended up building a rough mock-up based on what we had discussed and what was in my early designs. I presented the backpack mock-up to Ivan and we further talked about refinements and from there, it went to the prop builders. The pack frame was bought on October 6th and was an Alice or all-purpose lightweight individual carrying equipment frame. As Ivan Reitman put it, I knew the look I wanted for the equipment was a homemade hobbyist approach. None of this stuff should have the finished gloss that most science fiction gadgets have. I wanted to believe that somehow these men were working with like hi-fi equipment from the 70s. I wanted to feel the nuts and bolts. I thought it should impart the sensibility of guys working in their garages. According to Stephen Dane, it all started with the backpack. I went home and got foam pieces and just threw a bunch of stuff together to get the look. It was highly machined, but it had to look off the shelf in military surplus. When I was working on Blade Runner, I went out to the Tuscan airplane wrecking area and came back with two 40-foot flatbeds full of aircraft junk. And that sensibility showed up in Ghostbusters. Dane's prototype would be made of balsa wood and cardboard with final approval by Dan Aykroyd and Ivan Reitman. They were then turned over to Chuck Gaspar for construction. The Alice frame attached to an aluminum back and a fiberglass shell. The interior had several lights and the exteriors were decorated with a variety of surplus 1960s resistors, pneumatic fittings, and hoses. On October 22nd, Dane purchased the surplus warning labels, which would be applied when he arrived in New York. Well, that wasn't such a chore now, was it? While filming, the tips of the throwers would use incandescent bulbs as a cue when to add the visual effects. But what exactly are these streams? The final shoot script for Ghostbusters calls them ion streams, particle streams, and a stream of protons. So what were they, and does it really matter? It certainly did to Dan Aykroyd, who imagined this equipment. It's all explainable within the realm of, of physics as we know it. There's, there's really nothing that, that can't be explained if you, you know, you can, you, can, you can even grasp the concept of ghosts if you think about molecules and hydrogen in the air and how it's all composed of molecules and the ether and air around us really has a substance and it's all moving. And you have atoms which make, which make up everything in nature. You have a nucleus and then you have particles ro rotating around that nucleus. Well, you know, what's in between? There's space in between that. And, so that, and I think the space in between the the nucleus of an atom and an electron is, is as infinite as the space out there. As well as Harold Remus. I was concerned throughout this whole process that the physics of it makes sense somehow, that intelligent people wouldn't look at what we were doing and think it was totally ridiculous. For effects designer John Bruno, he imagined the streams was a two-way energy exchange with protons shooting out and a counterflow of particles pulled back into the gun's barrel. Which is why, if you watch the stream animation slowly, the orange beams shoot out while the blue bolts move oppositely. This may also be protons being ionized in the air, or some sort of discharge. Generally, it is agreed that the reason it is called a proton pack is because it fires protons. The neutrona wand is a purely fictional name, so we will be using particle thrower, which is a more appropriate name. It's also important to note that several part names on the Proton Pack were created by members of the Ghostbusters community, and when mentioning them, we give credit in the corner. Most names have not been accepted as canon, but are frequently used among fans. Are you ready? Switch me on. To get started, we need to talk about why a stream of protons are necessary for untangling ectoplasmic entities. After a body dies, the psychokinetic energy, or PKE, can linger on the corporeal plane. The structure and origin of PKE is at this point unknown. However, psychokinetic energy is able to ionize particles, negatively charging them. These ionized particles become a non-neutral plasma-like formation known as ectoplasm. Egon, your mucus. 
It is suspected the pKe bonds the particles, which is how the ionized particles can be maintained at a much lower temperature than typical plasmas. Take this hydrogen atom, which normally has one proton and one electron. The psychokinetic energy ionizes it with a valence electron and bonds other ions together. It took pKe valences, went right off the top of the scale. At low ionization levels, ectoplasmic entities are imperceivable or barely visible to the human spectrum. Hence why class ones are often invisible or mists. Is it just the mist that doesn't have arms and legs? A manifestation unable to collect and compose themselves of enough PKE and ions can become non-corporeal forms. Even with recognizable shapes, they may be missing limbs that were previously present. I don't remember seeing any legs, but it definitely had arms because it reached out for me. Extremely high levels of PKE can manifest tangible forms and interact with the physical plane. When an ectoplasmic manifestation interacts with physical objects, they leave trace amounts of PKE and a non-Newtonian fluid known as ectoplasmic residue. Research on ectoplasmic residue is what led to the findings of entities being composed largely of negatively charged ions. If the ionization rate is constant for all ectoplasmic entities, we could really bust some heads. In a spiritual sense, of course. Being negatively charged, ectoplasmic manifestations can be attracted by its polar opposite, a positive charge. By supplying a steady stream of protons, an ectoplasmic entity can be ensnared by using its own subatomic makeup against it. Capturing and containing the spirit indefinitely follows the same principle. Let's go back to the PKE bonded hydrogen ions. If a stream of protons approach the structure, their positive charge attracts the valence electrons, breaking the psychokinetic bonds, weakening the entity. See that overlay on the ghost? It indicates the current accumulation of a ghost's PKE. The more you disperse, the weaker it becomes. So with an elementary understanding of particle physics, no study. Let's talk about how the proton pack creates the proton stream. Despite initial drafts stating the packs would need an external source, Ghostbusters 2 confirms, power cells have a half-life of 5,000 years. This would likely mean they run on the radioactive isotope carbon-14, which has a half-life of 5,730 years. These power cells, or fuel pellets, are contained in a bundle of fuel rods that are inserted into the fuel core. But where did three parapsychology professors get their hands on this nuclear material? Ghostbusters Year One, Issue Two, actually addresses that. Ray states they had it left over from a previously approved experiment. The fuel core provides power to the accentuators, which regulates the amount of energy traveling to the primary power distributor, or PPD. The PPD directs power to the control arm, hydrogen gas actuator, and cyclotron through three external wires. The control arm contains the microprocessor and acts as the brain of the pack, monitoring and directing the flow of proton production. The hydrogen source is a refillable mini cylinder that contains 20 liters of hydrogen gas. A spare is stored right next to it. With energy from the PPD, the hydrogen gas actuator pulls the hydrogen directly into the ionization chamber. Inside, there is a thorium tungsten filament, heated white hot, which ionizes the hydrogen gas before being sent to the cyclotron. Power is supplied to the cyclotron through the injectors into the terminal panel on the bottom of the cyclotron and a connection point on top. These wires continue through the hose to the particle thrower as well. The ionized hydrogen is injected through a 3 8 of an inch copper rod that protrudes into a vacuum tight ceramic feed through. The particle emerges in between two hollow D shaped electrodes called Ds. An oscillator alternates the current in the Ds, so the negatively charged hydrogen is attracted to the positive D and repelled by the negative D. 
the oscillator then alternates the current, causing the particle to spiral back. This process repeats as the particle increases velocity and continues the spiral path. The rotating cyclotron lights indicate this spiral path. The particle exits the cyclotron and strikes an extraction foil composed of carbon. This strips the electrons, leaving only an accelerated proton, which travels to the particle thrower. Everybody getting this so far? The particle thrower has three toggle switches, which must be activated before the proton stream is released. The first switch activates the oscillator, but does not begin production of protons. The electromagnets inside the particle thrower must be activated by the second switch, for protons to begin moving from the accelerator to the thrower. Two electromagnets hold a negative charge which attracts the protons, preventing them from exiting the barrel. The third switch acts as a safety, preventing unintended streams from being released. All three switches must be on before the intensify control can be pressed to release the proton stream. Pressing the intensify control switches the polarity of the electromagnets and activates a third positive magnet, which repels the protons, propelling them out of the barrel. The stream can be intensified by turning this dial, which this bar graph displays. Adjusting the dial increases the frequency of alternating currents in the oscillator, producing more protons. Just be careful, this stream can be a bit unruly. But what do you think? Can physics be applied to science fiction, or are we just looking for ghosts? If you liked this video and think we deserve it, oh, nice shooting, Tex. please subscribe. If you are in the position to help, please support us on Patreon and keep coming back for more spooktacular videos. I'm Heidi with Channeling Spirits, and thanks for watching. Yes, science makes it do that.